If this is your first time attending a Native Plant Connection webinar, welcome. I'm so glad that you're here. If you haven't had an opportunity to check out our project website, I encourage you to please visit our Native Plant Connection website. From that website, you can access a list of all of our past webinars, the recordings, as well as a link to register for future webinars. And Jen, could you drop that link in chat for folks so that they can um, get the direct link to our website? I also want to thank our funders, the USDA, National Institute of Food and Agriculture, specifically the Specialty Crop Research Initiative, which is supporting this webinar series. Please mark your calendars for August 23rd, which will be our final webinar of the series. In this particular webinar, we're going to be presenting the results of a national survey of native plant growers in the United States who are specifically serving ornamental markets. Please note that due to a scheduling conflict that this, the date of this webinar has been adjusted to August 23rd. Um, just briefly, we heard from 42.5% of 825 native plant growers in the United States that are serving ornamental markets. Um, we will hear what they have to say and what they think is important and what's top in their minds for key priority areas of investment for research extension as well as professional networking. If you've attended a Native Plant Connection webinar in the past, um, you know that I always try to spotlight Native plants that were culturally important to the Indigenous people uh, representative of where our speaker is coming from today. And since Dr. Wilson is joining us from Florida, I found this wonderful um, Florida Extension Circular by Alan et al, which profiled 50 common um, native plants important in Florida's ethnobotanical history, a really great resource if you're interested in ethnobotany. Um, Jen, if you could drop the link to that PDF in chat, that would be great as well. And three particular plants that I wanted to call out are American groundnut, um, which is a type of bean, but called groundnut because the fruits have like a nutty flavor to them. Uh, American groundnut was also used for herbal medicinal uses as well. Uh, Black-eyed Susan, uh, which the leaves and the roots were also used for medicinal purposes by Florida's indigenous people and tribes and sawgrass, an important uh, material in weaving of baskets and other materials. If you're interested in learning more about the native tribes in your area where you're growing native plants, um, Native Land Digital, which is managed by a nonprofit in Canada, is a good starting place. Um, you can type in your location and see what tribes were um, uh, ancestral to that region and explore other ethnobotany resources from there. And uh, I will be dropping those links in chat because I forgot to give Jen share to everyone permission. So thank you everyone for your patience. Um, it's my real pleasure to hand over the floor to today's esteemed presenter. Uh, Sandra B. Wilson is a professor in the Department of Environmental Horticulture at the University of Florida. She completed her BS and her MS degrees from the University of Delaware, her PhD from Clemson University, and conducted postdoctoral studies at Clemson University and Chiba University in Japan. Her research focuses on native plant propagation and production, as well as evaluating the invasive potential of ornamental plants. And with that, I will hand it over to you, Dr. Wilson. Thank you so much for teaching us today. We go. Looks great. Well, thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you, Gail, for that nice introduction. And I just have to tell you, 
I have been looking forward to this webinar all summer. So I'm glad that you can, that we can be together finally today. I understand from Gail, there's over a hundred registrants. So thank you very much. Everyone here in the audience, I'm assuming, appreciates the many, many benefits that native plants can bring to our landscapes and gardens. And in our webinar series, we've covered important topics to the native plant industry so far, such as how um, the market plants, how the, how the market and the native plant market uh, works from, from Cami's talk, the importance of genetic diversity, the role of plant breeding and um, its efforts to preserve ecological function and how to even design our, or our ornamental landscapes with natives. Now, all of these um, are crucial for the efforts and the ability to propagate and produce natives for our ornamental markets. So today I'll be sharing about the decision-making process that goes into uh, propagating new plants to ultimately help increase our native plant palette. So this will include research that we have conducted with seeds, cuttings, and also uh, micropropagation. As you can see in, um, in these pictures here, these are some experiments we've done by seeds, cuttings, and micropropagation. Now, when we look at the native plants, Gil, are you seeing the slide that says web-based plant selectors? I am, yes. Okay, I just, I just wanted to make sure. So when we um, when we're starting to learn about native plants, one of the things that we see is there are a lot of web-based plant selectors. So these are some examples of different uh, plant selectors that I have used, and you can see uh, in this example, this is the Florida Friendly plant selector where you can select, you can filter whether or not you want natives or not. And then you can select for which region in Florida you um, are interested in growing the plants, what plant type, and also what environmental condition. So perhaps you can select shade versus sun or wet tolerant versus dry or attraction to pollinators and things like that. And these have all been very useful. Likewise, we also have a plethora of different native plant reference books that you can see here to help us learn more about their morphology, growth, and phenology. But all of these resources, including the plant selectors, um, contain brief at best information on how to propagate the various species that are referenced. So efforts have been made to create this online database called Restoration, um, Reforestation, Nurseries and Genetic Resources. And um, you can perhaps find a propagation protocol here. You can even contribute your own propagation protocol by adding it to the database. But really this has a long way to go to be comprehensive and universally, universally relevant to all of us. But it's a, a great start in the right direction. And now another challenge we face is the interest we see in native landscaping is not necessarily paralleled with the sales of native species. So for example, it's estimated that less than a quarter of our US natural flora is even in commercial production. And sales of these species constitute a very small portion of our ornamental plant industry as a whole. So thus again, there's a tremendous need for not only species specific propagation research, but also subsequent 
education and outreach. So there's a lot of opportunity here and this keeps my program very busy. As part of this program, we work with the industry to address a range of topics uh, that are listed here, including things like propagation, pollinator attraction, cultivar, cultivar evaluation, and even container media requirements. And we use two different approaches to do this. The first approach is to identify natives in their natural areas, such as these, and then work out the propagation and production protocols to see if they even merit nursery production and ultimate landscape use. So these are some pictures of some beautiful plants in their natural areas that we're trying to see if they'll lend themselves to cultivation. Uh, one of my graduate students in a population of a uh, Balduino population called the coastal honeycomb head and um, as just examples of approach one. Now our second approach is to identify underutilized natives that maybe only a handful of nurseries carry and to optimize their sexual and asexual propagation to ultimately broaden their production and use in landscapes. So in these examples, you can see one of my graduate state, uh, one of my graduate students with one of our local growers in a population of Garberia heterophylla that we are hoping to see in wider production. And these are other examples of species that I'll be talking about today, like the wild coffee species or Psychotria that uh, we've learned to propagate by cuttings the sweet acacia or Vachelia farnesiana seedlings, and also wild lime um, produced by cuttings or also called Synthoxylum fagera, and also uh, tissue culture. So in the next few slides, I'm just gonna show you some examples of some of the very attractive uh, potentially uh, ornamental wildflowers that we have studied using both of these approaches. So in this slide, you can see uh, six primary species and um, pictures of their seeds that we were able to capture, uh, a close-up of their flower showing how ornate they are, and then also what they look like in their natural setting. Other examples are here that we've studied. These plants are not only ecologically friendly, but they're also very attractive either in their form, sometimes their foliage color or their flowers. And uh, in some cases, particularly when we uh, bring them into cultivation and manage them. All of these are examples of plants that have limited commercial availability. So this would be approach two that we use. And we'd really like to see increased, um, increased use of them in the landscape and availability by additional nurseries. So I'll be sharing some of, of the propagation research we've done with these species later on in my talk. So to explore the propagation of really any given species, I always like to start with seed as a starting point because I want to capture that great genetic diversity that's inherent in the population. So our first task is always to find and identify natural populations to apply for those permits and to figure out the precise collection times. So this just shows a picture of, um, of the state and all the different counties, many of the different state parks we've used to collect seeds and, um, and other sampling areas. And we have such a nice setup in Florida because 
We have faculty uh, within UF located at all of these research and education centers throughout the state. And so we can collaborate with them for seed collection um, and also to be a field trial site so that we can address the geographical differences in ecotype effects in landscape performance. So this is a list of just some of the factors that we have to consider when we start with seed propagation. So seeds can actually be very complex. Essentially, every seed has three primary components, and that is the embryo that you can see here, the endosperm, and then the seed coat. And there are many physical and physiological processes that must be met in order for the seed to germinate. So we address many different factors, as I said, that may actually alter the seed germination, such as the initial stock plant or population health, the harvest maturity, which is the time when seeds can be harvested without significantly reducing their quality. The storage index, which is considered the time that more than half of the seeds can be expected to germinate under ambient storage conditions. And then other factors like um, abiotic factors that influence germination like temperature and light and substrate composition. So what I'd like to do is um, in the next few slides is kind of walk you through the process of how we handle seeds of varying species that have an unknown propagation potential. So preferably, we like to start with at least 1,500 seeds from robust populations or stock plants. And then once these seeds are cleaned, we isolate a subsample of them, and then we conduct what we call a tetrazoleum test and um, abbreviate it as a TZ test so that we can measure the, the potential viability of the seeds before they're subjected to germination tests. We then use another subsample of seeds and divide that subsample into four replications and then we expose those seeds to four main temperatures that you can see here. They're alternating temperatures. And we use these to mimic sort of spring, winter, summer, and fall in Florida. And then um, finally, we uh, the majority of the seeds that do not germinate, we then test them with the tetrazoleum treatment to figure out if they, if they are alive or not. And this allows us to calculate a percentage dormancy of the remaining seeds, and then to finally calculate the total percent germination of viable seed. So all of this together kind of goes into our initial starting point for seed propagation. So uh, this is a, an example showing you the pink, the pink stained seed here um, indicates respiration. So the seeds are likely viable, but that's a destructive measure. So sometimes we also like to parallel this with uh, x-ray analysis. So in this picture here of a um, native Tennessee sunflower, you can see that some of these seeds are completely full. Uh, with an embryo presence, and then other seeds are hollow or have a very rudimentary uh, underdeveloped embryo. To the right, um, you can see one of my graduate students, and she has a big smile on her face because she was able to uh, meet with one of our native growers who actually had um, additional seeds on hand, and this is going to be the seeds inside this bag are going to be used for her master's project. 
And, um, and behind her are, just to give you an idea of the four incubators that we use, um, they're each set to different temperatures. So simultaneously, we can see the seed response at the same time. And here you can just see um, a little radical protrusion of these uh, native sunflower seeds that we monitor daily to <clears throat> count for germination. So we arrange all of our seeds in these germination boxes that are wonderful because they have lids that open and close very easily. And uh, you can see here, this is a paste, this white, um, this white blotter plate water paper is used at the bottom to absorb water. And then we put this piece of sort of like crepe paper over top of that. And then we line up all of the, all of the seeds and then put all of these germination boxes in the different temperatures. And we not only measure how many seeds, like how many of these seeds germinated, but we also measure how fast they germinated and we measure their overall uniformity. So those three traits, uh, percentage, speed, and uniformity are collectively very important to characterize the seeds overall vigor. So in this example, what we see here is germination percent on the y-axis and then um, time by weeks on the x-axis. And the different colors represent the different temperatures. So what this shows just in this simple study is that initially the, uh, the colder temperature, which is indicated by blue, delayed germination, which is what we could expect. But eventually that germination paralleled with the other two spring and fall temperatures. And what we also found in this example is these seeds that are indicated by purple um, also had a delayed germination, but then that germination, as you can see here, never was able to catch up with the other temperatures. And so that the, the heat of that summer temperature did have an ultimate effect on final germination. And all of this can be important when we're characterizing any given species. So primary dormancy is a condition where seeds will not germinate even when the environmental conditions are permissive. And this, this can be exogenous or outside of the seed or endogenous or inside the seed, or it can be a condition of both. So to the right is a decision tree that we adopted to determine what type of what type of tests we need to do to determine what type of dormancies a seed may have. So up at the top here, we start with a uh, collection of, of fresh seeds that, that we know are mature. And then if it has low germination under all conditions, then we check to determine if the seeds contain embryos at all. We can do that through x-ray analysis. And then we further check to see if the embryos are actually viable. And then we can determine the outcome of whether or not the seeds, uh, we can conclude that the seeds are dormant. And then we can test the seeds to see if they have an impermeable seed coat or if they're impermeable to water uptake. If that is the case, we can do some quick experiments to to break up that seed coat. And if they can germinate with those treatments, we can finally conclude that the seeds have this physical dormancy. An easy way to see if seeds have physical dormancy is to place them in water and then to measure how much water they uptake over time by measuring their fresh weight. So in these examples with uh, two native species called uh, joint, joint weed, 
what we did is we just carefully nicked the end of the seed. And then uh, for half of the seeds, we, we didn't nick the seeds. And then we measured, uh, we placed them in water and then we just measured the fresh weight increase over time. So in these open circles, you can see that the seeds were able to uptake water faster than the closed circles or unnicked seeds. Yet both of both seed treatments were still able to uptake water. So we can conclude definitively that these seeds do not have a physical dormancy. So if they do have a hard seed coat, often imposed by these um, macrosclerid cells that you see here, then we have to manually abrade the seed coat. And this is what we call scarification. So with the species um, in this example called phase prairie clover or Dahlia phaei, we germinated these seeds at four different temperatures with and without um, acid scarification. In this case, we use sulfuric acid. And you can see in the yellow are the acid treated seeds and the germination um, much improved when we, you, when we conducted this treatment. So we can do this and we can also look for clues because sometimes certain families we know are prone to have seeds with hard seed coats. So these are families like Convolvulaceae, Malvaceae, Babaceae, as in this example, and Ericaceae. So sometimes we can just look at the families for a clue of our starting point in germination. And scarification can be performed by a number of different ways, not just sulfuric acid, which is sometimes um, tricky to handle, but also by hot water, sandpaper, and even any type of rock tumbler. So it's fairly straightforward. What I wanted to show you here is mechanical scarification that we performed by sandpaper or um, hot water treatment. And in this case, we're showing data from seeds that were, um, they were placed in boiled water and then that boiled water was allowed to come to room temperature overnight. So with legumes, as you might remember when you're soaking, um, when you're soaking any kind of bean overnight, if you're gonna cook it the next day, um, you can visibly see them swell. And with this legume of sweet acacia or Vichelia farnesiana, we could see the same thing. Uh, so we didn't really have to conduct an imbibition test because we could already tell that the seeds uh, were much larger and had imbibed that water. But what was interesting is that with these seeds, only a fraction of the seeds were visibly, had visibly imbibed and appeared swollen. The other fraction of the seeds uh, did not appear swollen. So we were wondering if uh, this had, would have an effect on the ultimate germination. So that's what you see here. The, um, the red lines here, so this is percentage of emergence, on the y-axis and days after sowing on the x-axis. And you can see in this red line here, these were seeds that were scarified with hot water and that visibly imbibed. The next blue line shows seeds that were scarified with hot water, um, but they did not have visible swelling. And then finally, this was the control seeds that were not um, scarified with hot water. So right away, you can tell that just by, um, by germinating the imbibed seeds that looked swollen, we had a 100% germ, almost 100% germination in, in 30 days, which is fantastic. Uh, then uh, in this next treatment here, germination was slower if we didn't visibly see the swelling. And, um, but eventually, if you look, it, the, the swollen and non-swollen seeds caught up with each other. So it's not necessarily a practice that you need to do if you have um, this appropriate amount of time for them to germinate. In this case, it was a little over four weeks. 
But if time is not on your side, you certainly would want to use the hot water scarification because you would get seedlings faster. And all of this is compared to seeds that um, barely germinated. So they really do need that abrasion of the seed coat. Let me see. Um, so one other really interesting thing we found from this study, and this is why I really love science, is because we always are discovering things that we didn't intend to discover and that weren't part of our original goals. So when we looked at all of these seedlings that germinated, and you can see here, some of them had three cotyledons, some of them have four cotyledons, and some of them had the typical two cotyledons that you would expect with most um, dicotyledonous plants. And um, we counted those, and the majority of them actually had three cotyledons, followed by two cotyledons, followed by four cotyledons. And we were interested in if this, if this cotyledon difference actually compromised the seedling's ability to grow or if it affected future branching of the species. And in this case, we found that it did not. So there's not necessarily a advantage to selecting seeds that have two, three, or four cotyledons. But it's interesting uh, nonetheless, and it may help in your uniformity. Another phenomenon that we sometimes encounter is ecotypic effects on seed germination. So for example, these are seeds of a species called wild lime or Xanthoxylum figera. It's a native species in the citrus family. And these seeds were collected from two different populations. The, um, and the populations came from different parts of the state, either in uh, North Central Florida or in South Florida. So this was very interesting because you can see differences. You can see that these North Florida seedlings responded differently to the temperatures than the South Florida seedlings, which had much higher germination rates. And we did not expect to see this. So what we found was an interaction between ecotype or origin that the plants were seeds were collected and temperature. So look at this. Summer, the summer treatment had an adverse effect on germination in the South Florida population. But this was not translated into the North Central seeds. In the North Central population, these seeds actually had actually had um, did somewhat had somewhat less germination in the summer compared to uh, so, or in the winter, excuse me, compared to the other differences, um, as you can see here. And um, so this just tells us that seeds respond different, can respond to, of the species, can respond differently to different temperatures depending on where they're collected. And this really is why universal propagation protocols can be so challenging. So these results also tell us that a degree of, of, um, of these seeds, a portion of these seeds probably possess some level of physiological dormancy. And what was interesting is that we did conduct the pre-germination viability on these seeds, and it was similar among both locations at 86 or 87%. So we, that's what we expected to get in our germination results for both locations. In physiological dormancy, the embryo lacks the growth potential to allow the radical to escape and, and um, the, to escape the restraint of the seed coat coverings. The most moist chilling or the application of a hormone we call gibberellic acid can be administered to mobilize the endosperm reserve material that we call starch to um, be accessible to the developing embryo. 
So just like with certain families that have hard seed coats, there are species of certain families that are prone to this type of dormancy. This includes our cornice, um, the, um, or, or dogwoods, the critigus, or hawthorns, cerces, or red buds, and, um, and others like sassafras and cayenanthus. And there are a number of different ways to treat seeds with this type of dormancy. Some of these ways are shown here. So in this example, we treated seeds of a native species called coastal honeycomb head or Baldwina angustifolia from, and these seeds were collected from these four different populations that you can see here. And we treated these seeds with four different concentrations of gibberellic acid that you can see here. And what was very interesting is again, we had this ecotype we had an interaction between ecotype and gibberellic acid concentration. What that meant, means is you can see these two populations here had high germination irregardless of the GA concentration. It was non-significant whether we applied GA or not. Yet these seeds from these last two populations um, had, had, um, had lower germination but there was an effect of gibberellic acid on that germination. And so for these seeds, we see that we can treat them with either 250 parts per million or milligrams per liter gibberellic acid or 500 parts per million gibberellic acid with the same effect. So this was a really interesting observation for this species. And it was also really neat because um, we did not expect to see this because not only did the seed germination response differ by population, but also their growth, their, uh, their color, and also their leaf morphologies were very different. So you can see very striking differences in um, all of these different morphologies. And this is something that could be important because it could be of uh, great horticulture interest and in, in things that we can select for, especially when using these plants for landscapes. Well, a final important aspect of seed handling that we address is the storage potential of seeds. And while we always try to use fresh seeds, sometimes there's an advantage or necessity to store the seeds. In this example, um, we, we can store the seeds at different uh, months, like one, two, three, four, all the way to three years, and see if they lose their viability over time. We also do this procedure called cryopreservation. And in cryopreservation, we treat the seeds with liquid nitrogen and different buffering solutions to see if we can um, extend the storage lice and offer a potential germplasm um, long-term storage. Uh, so we have done this with uh, the wild lime seeds that I mentioned before. So there's lots of ways you can trick seeds to germinating, but what do we do with species that have very narrow collection times or when you want to clonally select for a different for a certain trait or when you want to reduce your production time? So in these scenarios, cutting propagation can be a useful approach. And these are some examples of many different species that we've tried. Basically, any seed that we test for seed germination, we also will evaluate its performance for potential cutting propagation. So what we do here is we subject cuttings like you can see here to different combinations of different auxins and also uh, different auxin concentrations. Here you can see nine different concentrations we use and it's to determine which one of these will give us our best fruit quality. So this is an example of typical cutting propagation experiments and data that we'll collect. We don't just look at 
what the propagation, what the rooting percentage was, but it's also very important to look at how many roots there was per cutting and also what that root, root length was to determine the overall rooting performance. These are some cuttings that we took of the, um, the joint weed polygonal. Now, um, this is an example of wild coffee. And um, in addition to looking at rooting percent and root length and root number, we also did this rooting quality index where we had a one was designated for plants that didn't root but were alive. And then a four was designated for plants that had optimal rooting and could really hold that root ball. And this is the data looking at that root quality where uh, the root quality scale, one would be not rooted and four would be rooted. And then these are all four different species. And you can see this interaction between that not all species responded the same to different concentrations of auxin. So in this case, it may be important to, um, to test the different species of a genus and determine which one is uh, most optimal. In these two cases here, we, there was a benefit to using a higher auxin concentration that wasn't evident in these first two species. So despite all of these efforts, sometimes we um, seeds and cuttings are still problematic and our propagation is slow or they're needed in huge quantities that requires large scale propagation. In this case, we use micropropagation. And all of this is, is really starting with the donor plant and then um, doing different techniques to establish those plants and then using um, different concentrations of cytokinin that's included in the media, as you can see here, to multiply those shoots, transfer those shoots to um, a different media that has an auxin in it that will increase roots, and then eventually acclimate them to the greenhouse. So this is one of my graduate students that was working with Paranechia erecta. So in these examples, you can see a seedling that we used for, of um, the sweet acacia. And that seedling was then used to generate um, shoots that were then placed in this media to generate more shoots. And in this study here, we actually determined what the best benzylabinine or the best auxin concentration was. In this case, it didn't matter. And then we had to determine what the best, um, what the best, I'm sorry, in, in this case, we had to determine what the best cytokinin concentration was. And then in this example, we had to determine what the best auxin concentration was because we wanted to increase rooting. But you can see here, there actually was, by using 10 times more auxin, we could increase the rooting percentage to 100%. So finally, we move the shoots um, that we acquire in culture to what we call stage four or acclimatization. And sometimes we have to use different humidity domes or mist or shade because these plants are not function, functioning properly. They don't have developed cuticles. They don't have functioning stomats and their photosynthetic apparatus is compromised due to the in vitro conditions. So we look at all of that to increase our survival, hopefully to 100%. This was another species that we looked at, and all this does is show you 15 different genotypes. So, so these were all from the same genus and species, but, um, but different samples. And to the left, you can see here, the, uh, this was the control, and then to the right was a, um, a shoot cluster that was put on media with the, um, an appropriate BA concentration or cytokinin concentration. So with, this res with these results, we were able to, um, to achieve shoot multiplication with this species of square stem flower. 
And, um, and finally, with this example, we use a wild lime where uh, we tried seeds, uh, using seeds as the explant source. We tried immature buds as the explant source. We tried leaf sections as the explant source. And we also tried internodes as the explant source. And we could never get to stage, um, we could never get past stage one, but we're still working on this species in tissue culture. And these studies are important because our major tissue culture facility in Florida, as an example, has a whole line of natives that are propagated um, through micropropagation. And these are some examples of those seen here. Many of these are important pollinator plants. Well, I've really enjoyed our time that we've had to, together. I feel like it's gone way too fast. Um, I wanted to share this slide because the majority of the research um, I've shared has been published in referee journals. For those of you who might want to take a deeper dive into uh, this information, just go to this website and there you can find um, not only information I've posted for the class I teach on Florida native landscaping, but also all of these different propagation research projects. And with that, I just want to end by thanking the USDA for funding this collaborative initiative and also for all of our other great funding agencies uh, that we have in Florida that supported our work, all the different faculty collaborators and the many, many graduate students that have worked on different aspects of these projects. So with that, I will conclude this presentation and thank you again so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Wilson. That was fabulous. As an entomologist, I learned so much about basic seed biology and plant physiology from that presentation. For folks that are here today, if you have any questions, please write them into the Q&A pod. A couple of questions that I had that came up during your presentations um, presentation is I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the permitting process uh, to collect native seed, just for somebody who um, may be starting up a native plant nursery, maybe um, they're interested in doing a BLM collection. Um, what would you suggest as a starting point to even figure out how to navigate through that process? Is your local extension office or Department of Agriculture a good place to start? Okay, so are you specifically asking like if somebody wanted to um, kind of maybe start their own nursery or just start kind of as a hobbyist propagating plants at um, home? Yeah, I'm talking Local. more for collection of seed for commercial purposes, okay, uh, for maybe commercial. someone at the early stages of a native plant nursery. Um, yeah, so so the, the Florida wildfire Foundation has actually done a beautiful job of providing um, of providing if if anyone just googles the Florida Wildflower Foundation of um, collection guidelines and that kind of talks about how large of a population it should be, how to minimize um, how much of the plants you should even collect for permitting and all of that stuff. So to start somebody out who's new that wants a seed population, um, I, I would suggest doing what I do and it's networking, networking, networking. The extension agents are a great place to go uh, to figure out that almost everyone knows of someone who might have access to that piece of land. And um, certainly all the native nurseries have their favorite places that they collect seeds, but you know, it can be a battle to um, to figure out, you know, what is an appropriate site to collect seeds. We also have a number of, um, of gardens where we can collect seeds from managed plants that also could be relevant. We have a energy saving technology. I love it. I love it. <laughs> So Rufino has a question. Um, what was the website you mentioned at the end of your talk to obtain more information regarding your research? Oh, okay, sure. Yeah, maybe um, Jen can put that in the um, in the comment box. 
it's the website on that last slide. And uh, just briefly, that would be, um, it's I-R-R-E-C-E-N-V-H-O-R-T dot IFAS dot U-F-L dot E-D-U. Awesome. I was able to find- and, and also, I'm glad, I'm very, very pleased to see Rufinio out there in, in our audience because I, I use his book for my class. That's wonderful. So Rodolfo has a question. I collect native fruit trees and calabash tree varieties. Is it possible to keep viable the plants by growing them in containers and renewing them by air layering? So using using container containerized plants as your stock as as their stock plant source, I think that that's what they're asking. Um, absolutely, uh, we have a number of species that, uh, for one reason or another, we have them in uh, large containers. And um, in in fact, with wild lime as an example, we found that um, that we could get better rooting percentages on cuttings taken from those plants grown in containers. So certainly that could, um, that could lend itself to air layering as well. Thank you. Ed is asking if you found any one substrate to be more successful for transplanting seedlings. Oh, well, um, oh, Ed, that's, now you've got me excited. So that's a whole nother talk that I'm going to be giving. Um, it's going to be an extension talk uh, later on. I think it's in September. And, um, the, and, and what that is, is the effect of containerized media on, um, on native plant success. And so to a, a quick answer, there is no quick answer to your, to your question, but Absolutely, we have found we have found dramatic effects on containerized media and uh, plant performance. And just to give you a clue, sometimes you can figure out where that plant is native to, like if it's a wetland species or an upland species, and then that can give you a clue as to how much sand you might need to add or how much peat it might be able to tolerate. And I certainly also look at renewable resources like compost. And if you go to that website that was posted, actually many, many publications on that subject are there. And that can, that can give you your answer pretty quickly. Thank you. So on the topic of substrates, I'm going to go to a related question, whether or not you've experimented with using native sandy soils as potting media. So we, we did, yes, yes. So we have done studies because it's a question that, you know, it, it's an obvious question that we wanted to understand. Um, it was an endangered species. So what we did was we, uh, we tested it in the not modified sand, but we took the the sand from the population that it would that it naturally grew in it would naturally reproduce in, and compared that with a, um, a modified container media. And in that case, the seeds were able to germinate um, similarly, and the media didn't give it an advantage. Uh, that publication is also um, on my website that you can find, but. Um, with sand, it's tricky because in, in the media that I like the best, it, it does have 30% uh, is about the highest amount of sand that we can add to a container that doesn't make it too heavy. And so it's this fine balance. And I hope that answered your question. Thank you. Great answer. And Cami uh, wrote a comment in the Q&A pod also about the weight that sand has, that sand adds to a container. So that 30% threshold as being like the good middle ground is fabulous. Mm -hmm. um, there's a, more of a comment than a question in the chat. Um, complimenting you on the tools that you've been developing. Um, noting that there is great demand for native plants. There are many easy to propagate natives that have commercial demand, but nurseries are not doing so. 
In other words, there are low hanging fruits that are not being picked. And then Janine has a question about whether or not you've used heated benches to encourage germination. Heated heated benches are are a uh, are work in so many ways and um, with with cutting propagation and with seed propagation. Um, using we've used heated benches that have the biotherm tubing where the hot water runs through them. And absolutely, it helps us uh, be able to propagate plants year round in, in many cases. The greenhouses that we have, believe it or not, at the University of Florida do not are not equipped with that specialized tubing. So we actually have to bring in mats. And uh, I don't prefer them because I think that it 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 changes the airflow dynamics and uh, the sanitation isn't isn't favorable. And so all of the studies that I've used have not used um, all of the research that I've reported, at least in today's seminar, um, did not use um, bottom heating, but we have done studies that compared bottom heating with non-bottom heating and it absolutely works. Thank you. Um, just related to that, a follow-up, Jean Neen is wondering, are there any particular natives that you found that benefit from heat? Um, in, in, the, in the studies that we did with heat, we were using it in order, in order to get an early start on the propagation. So any, it, it sort of depends on where, you, I mean, this was, these studies were done in South Florida, which you wouldn't even think that we would need uh, bottom heat for, but we did. So, um, so just think of it in terms of uh, providing everything in that cell, including warmth, that would increase your germination or increase your rooting percentages. The bottom heat can especially be helpful in uh, cutting propagation because those roots just will not push out if the soil is too cold. Thank you. Um, Abra wants to know the release date for your book, your Florida Native Plant Propagation book. Ah, oh. oh, thank you. So I took a sabbatical leave two years ago to work on this book that compiled all of this data in, um, and we have it drafted. And I had to take a hiatus from that and, uh, because I was committed to other, other things, but it is in the works. We have selected all the plants for it. We've written out all the propagation of them. It's just really at the stage where we need layout and, um, and just consistency and messaging and things like that. So I would say it's about halfway done because the other half takes considerable time. But um, I'm actually working with a former graduate student of ours who got his PhD here. And we try to keep us uh, each other on task. Thank you for asking. Stay tuned. Um, so Cami uh, is dropping some uh, resources in the chat. Um, there is a question about whether or not uh, folks could get a link to your soil medium webinar. If you sure, so if they, um, I, I guess the best way would be to email me, and then I'll make sure you get it. And my email address is uh, maybe we can put it in the in the window. There yes, it is. Thank I you dropped um, Dr. Wilson's email in chat. And um, Robert has um, either or questions, alkaline versus acid scar offense. Um, we, we have only used acid um, for to scarify seeds. And actually we've gotten away from that just because it's it's just I don't I don't feel comfortable with students using it, um, and um, we found better techniques that work just as well. Um, and then final question uh, for the day. Thank you so much. This is great to have so much um, such a lively Q and A session. Topophytic variation in cutting source. Okay, so. Um, 
for that, I'm going to, so absolutely that is, um, that is something we have to consider. And um, there is an entire lecture on that, that is part of one of the chapters in the propagation textbook that I co-authored. And, um, and that can be found under the propagation tab under my website that you had posted, if you want to post that again. We talk about that in those lectures. Sometimes it matters and sometimes it doesn't is the is the short answer to that question. Hey, I just um, dropped that website in chat once more. Um, thank you, Dr. Wilson, and thank all of you who showed up today to expand your minds and knowledge about native plant propagation. Greatly appreciate all of you. Um, please make sure if you're interested in that survey of native plant growers to join us on August 23rd. We'll see you next month. Take care. Bye, everyone.